It's forecast, but there, well, yeah, we, there can we are. See, we can see the state of the parties after the 82, which takes in Mid-Scotland and Fife now. Yeah. So we're in a position to look at that uh, state of the parties. There we have Labour on 49, SNP on 14, Liberal Democrats on 13, Conservative on 4, and two others. So we have um, three more. We've got Annabel Ewing, that's another Ewing elected, um, Bruce Crawford and uh, George Reid, who didn't get in in Oakle, but who's now in on the regional list on Mid-Scotland and Fife. David Denver, it's all starting to change yes, uh, I mean, here now. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I was really pleased when a, a couple of constituencies actually changed hands because it just gets really boring. The same parties holding the same constituency for election after election. Uh, and so just towards the end there were those two really quite exciting changes. And Peter Snow's going to take us through them. Peter? Yes, Mid Scotland on Fife. Here we go. Uh, up here with a great big slab of SNP. Just actually two seats. There's Labour and there's Fife North East for the Liberal Democrats. Those are the constituency results, nine of them. Now here are the second votes that have now been totted up. 101,000 for Labour. Look how well the SNP have done in second votes in Mid Scotland on Fife. There's the Tories on nearly 57,000 and the Liberal Democrats down here, 20,000 others. Noticeable how many votes, second votes particularly, the others are getting. There's the share of the second votes. That share will drive the allocation of the top-up seats in Mid-Scotland and Fife. Labour taking the lion's share of the directly elected uh, constituency seats. There's two going down to the SNP there, Rosanna Cunningham and John Swinney. And over here, one Liberal Democrat seat taken directly in Fife North East. Now, here are the candidate lists down there, and of course you can see what's got to happen. The Tories with a fifth of the vote, no seats directly elected, and the SNP clearly deserve a few more seats there. So let's see which ones have actually won on the list there. It goes from the top downwards, but of course John Swinney and Rosanna Cunningham have already got seats. So George Reid and Marwick and Crawford get seats for the SNP. Harding, Johnson and Monteith, that's Brown Monteith there who led the No campaign, and Keith Raffin here joins uh, the other Liberal Democrat who was elected in Fife North East. And so we have now the profile of the seats down here, the share of the seats down here reflecting the share of the vote up there. And so again, all four main parties represented in Mid-Scotland and Fife Kirsty. Thank you very much indeed. Um, coming back to you, Henry McLeish, um, overall, um, you've got, there's another Labour win, Edinburgh North and Leith, but overall, um, in your safe seats, you're down a good 10%. Are you complacent about that? No, certainly not complacent, Kirsty, but I think if you look at the pattern, it enormously throughout, throughout the country. We're going over now to the central region result for the central region. I therefore declare Kate McCree to be duly elected. So that, uh, that's a Labour hold for Dundee West. You'll be, um, that's another second recount. You'll be quite relieved about that, Henry McLeish. I'm certainly re relieved. Um, I'm glad to see Kate McLean in because she's part of our uh, shadow front team. But I think the position varies enormously throughout, throughout the country, Kirsty, because um, in terms of swings, because in my own constituency, for example, we were only 1% down. Well, we're uh, just hearing that there's more results coming in now, and we're positioned to go back over to Peter Snow for some more details. Peter. Yes, here we are, Kirsty. I'm just running over. We're just going to get to the computer very quickly. Here we go. Let's have a look now at what's happened in central Scotland. There's Labour taking all the constituency seats, except, of course, Dennis Canavan's, which he took in Falkirk West. Those are the constituency seats. Regional votes all totted up. 129,000 for Labour, 91,000 for the SNP, and 30,000 for the Tories down here. Liberal Democrats, just look at the great chunk of votes here again for the others. The most noticeable thing about this election is how the others have been taking these second votes. People, as uh, Brown was saying earlier, of the rainbow group taking, the rainbow parties taking a lot of second votes. 40% then the share for the Labour Party, 28% the SNP, and 9% the Tories. Let's push that up the top of the screen there so you can see how the regional seats will be allocated once we've dealt with the nine Labour wins in the constituency seats, and of course Dennis Canavan over here, we now add the lists, waiting to see which of them have won the regional top-up seats. And here we go. There's the SNP with no less than five of the top-up seats, because they, after all, had uh, something like 28-30% of the vote up there. Just one for the Tories, just scraping in there. Donald Gorry, the MP uh, for Edinburgh West, scraping in there for the Liberal Democrats on the list in central Scotland and, of course, Dennis Caliban. So there we have the whole picture. And again, once again, the 
profile of the seats down at the bottom here matches the profile of the votes at the top. Again, proportional representation effectively in action in central Scotland. Thank you very much, Peter. And we are starting to get the regional picture rather quickly. We may not be getting it uh, down in the, the southwest of Scotland, but we are going to start picking up uh, more regional results. Um, Ian Hudson, so the SNP map looks slightly different now. Well, uh, I think that that's what we've been saying uh, all night, that the whole picture is what uh, counts and uh, clearly the purpose of the, the proportional part of the ballot is to even out the inconsistencies that exist with First Past the Post and uh, I think that uh, we are now uh, achieving uh, our fair share uh, based on the share of the vote and we are going to have a very, very uh, large uh, group in the new parliament. Um, in terms of uh, the first piece of uh, putative legislation the SNP are planning to put forward, what might that be? Well, I think that we will uh, add up the numbers first uh, uh, over the weekend uh, and we will uh, establish our priorities uh, based on the, the numbers in our group. But we uh, made uh, a, a number of uh, commitments uh, during the campaign uh, based on the hope that we perhaps might be uh, in a position to uh, to deliver them and we will have to see uh, how the numbers add up to see whether we can uh, uh, deliver some uh, or, or indeed all of the commitments uh, that we made. Of course the um, SNP group is going to be a, a pretty interesting affair isn't it because then what you're going to have I mean I think it would be fair to say that Alex Salmond as, as a gradualist uh, pragmatist perhaps uh, for the last few years is most of it all his own way but now he's going to be joined by some feisty characters <coughs> or perhaps what we might call one more much more fundamentalist nationalists. Well, we're all in this party uh, to promote uh, and to hopefully achieve uh, self-government for Scotland and uh, we're united in that uh, and always have been. Um, Brian Taylor, how do you think the complexion of uh, the nationalist group at, uh, in Edinburgh will change? I, I think it'll be an intriguing prospect. I mean, they, they, at the moment we're project, project, projecting about 35 seats for them. Now, if you look at the, if the 1997 election pattern were, were, were repeated in the, the, the new voting system that we're using, they would have been entitled to 28. So, I mean, they have improved on that. I know the, um, some members of the, the analytical media were suggesting that, that Alex Salmon had to get 40 seats to survive. I've never quite taken that view. It's a case of momentum. It's a case of how the, the party is perceived more generally. But within the group, there's going to be some feisty characters who take a very different view about the approach of the, the SNP, who will want to see independence far higher up the agenda than it was um, perhaps it, during this, this uh, admittedly, a campaign but, fighting for devolution. But might that uh, impose a change on the way the SNP approached the Parliament? Because the idea that uh, it was going to be positive cooperation in the Parliament, of course that policy only survived as long as Alex Salmon was calling the shots. But if you have fundamentalists, you might be talking about you know, heaven for fend, wrecking the Parliament. I think the defining moment for the SNP was not Kosovo, it was not tax, it wasn't any policy initiative. It was the fact that they joined with the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats and the others in the, in the, the referendum campaign. From that moment on, they became an independence party fighting a devolution campaign, fighting basically on somebody else's platform. It's, it's a political dysfunction that caused a problem for them from the very outset of the campaign. Now, strategically for the future, they've got to decide, do they turn themselves back into a gutsy, full-blooded independence party, as some would argue that's the way to win, or do they go down the road of perhaps the likes of Jordi Pujol in, in, in Catalonia, the, the, the region of Spain, who found that, that, that independence was not the road to pursue? Do you become institutionalised to the devolved Scottish Parliament? That's a hell of an argument. Would you like to become, do you think there's a chance to become institutionalised? I, mean, I know it is at quarter to six in the morning, but we'd like to hear your views and whether or not you'll be subsumed with the great wave of devolution and decide that actually enough's enough. Well, this is quite fascinating. I, I uh, and many others in the Scottish National Party have never changed our position over uh, a long number of years. But do you that agree we, with uh, the, the approach uh, that Alex Salmond took, that there would be a gradualist approach and devolution was simply a step? Well, a step. Certainly it was an important step uh, and a step that the people of Scotland voted for. Uh, uh, but it is a step in the right direction. But the majority the things, of people in Scotland have voted for parties that support the union, the new if, Britain that Gordon Brown talks about. Well, we'll see how the, the new parliament delivers on expectations. One of the, the consistent things that has happened in, have happened in other uh, European regions uh, under devolution as this the, is a country these, parliaments, not a region, of these parliaments have gone on to uh, dramatically increase their powers over time uh, and uh, we will look uh, and see uh, how we can best help to make the parliament Ed work. Thank you very much. Edinburgh South is about to declare. We can go straight over there now. And Here is the that. result of the election Edinburgh West, I apologize. in the Scottish Parliament constituency, Edinburgh West. The percentage poll was 67.1%. The votes cast for each candidate were as follows. 
James Alexander Douglas Hamilton, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 10,578. Carol Ann Fox, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 8,860. Margaret Joy Smith, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 15,161. Graham Donald Sutherland, Scottish National Party, 6,984. And I declare that Margaret Joy Smith has been duly elected to... So there was Margaret Smith who uh, beat the sitting the MP Donald Goy to the nomination. Uh, he comes in under the list. So that's another successful Liberal Democrat uh, return to the Edinburgh Parliament. We've got the share of the vote there, Liberal Democrats in 36, Conservatives 25, Labour 21, SNP 17. And the change, Liberal Democrat votes down 7%, Conservatives down, Labour's up 3 percentage points there, and the SNP is up 8%. There we have it. And uh, now we can have a wee look now at uh, the forecast and moving on now to see some uh, pages which will tell us exactly where we are. The BBC forecast based on 92 of 129 results. Labour the largest party, but no change from early in the evening, no overall control. Uh, we'll be looking to see over the weekend how um, the coalition talks get going. And the state of the party is Labour on 51, SNP on 19, Liberal Democrat on 15, Conservatives on 5, and we await more Conservatives coming in from the list, and the others too. And uh, based on 92 results, what we're going to have is Labour on 57, SNP on 34, Conservatives 19, Liberal Democrats too, and it doesn't appear as if we are going to have any more uh, independents or individuals sitting in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, that job will be down to Tommy Sheridan and Dennis Canavan. Um, Henry McLeish, do you look forward to um, having uh, Tommy Sheridan and Dennis Canavan in the Parliament with you? Well, I, I'd have been happier if we had um, won uh, Dennis Canavan's seat, uh, Kirsty. But I think it's been a, a night of steady progress uh, for the uh, Labour Party. The prediction there at 57, total 51. Um, obviously, we, we haven't got a, a picture of the whole result, but, um, but clearly we, we've done well and um, we're very pleased with the progress that's being made. <coughs> Would you have been happier had Dennis Canavan uh, been selected by the selection panel and fought that seat as a Labour? No, I think the decisions that were taken by the party throughout were the right ones. Um, I mean, nobody, nobody has a right to get on any panel, Kirsty, and I think it was a fairly rigorous panel. That was a decision that was made by the independent panel, and that was pursued. And that, I think that's, that's the reality which I certainly supported. Uh, Mark, it's interesting to see that so far it looks as if we don't have any ethnic minorities in this parliament mm. whatsoever. Well, that appears to be the case, but I don't think you can criticise the parties for not putting forward candidates. And there were one or two who actually got quite close, certainly in Liberal Democrats. I noticed the, our second candidate in the Glasgow list was, in fact, a, a, an Asian candidate. Um, and uh, um, I, I just all one can say is that the system does allow for that. And I think, I think you'll find that, that the parliament changes uh, on the subsequent elections because ethnic minorities will get to the top of the list. Mm. David Denver, can you see that this is a, a, you know, an experiment? This is the first parliament under this system. Of course, yeah. in four years' time, things are going to look very, well, of very course, different. Yeah. But list systems are actually the, the best uh, for improving the proportion of A, women, as we've already seen here, and B, any minority you care to be actually wanting to promote. Because uh, it allows the parties you know, to, to place people in, in a kind of order which almost can guarantee. Now, in this case, it didn't quite come off in the case you mentioned, but in the case of the women, certainly, certainly did. I, I, well, uh, I, I, I don't know if we can have it just now, because I'm not sure if we're up to date with the tally, but at this stage with 92, we'll probably tell you that uh, oh, women, uh, women elected are well into the 40s, and so that mm. will, in fact, I'm not sure if it's definitely the case, but it looks as if it will perhaps <coughs> equal uh, the only other European Parliament in Sweden, which is a, a representation of 40% of women, I think that uh, Scotland will be well on its way to achieving that. And although we have um, four suits sitting here, um, I suspect this will be the last time that we have uh, simply four suits sitting around a panel like this because the whole nature of politics in Scotland will change and more women will be in prominent positions. But I think that should be warmly welcomed and I think uh, many parties have taken steps, especially Labour, to have a twinning system which resulted in more women getting w winnable seats. But I do think it's important to look further ahead because on the gender issue progress is being made and if this parliament can have the highest majority of women of any parliament in Europe, that's a very significant step forward. But 
on the ethnic minority side, there's more to be done. The Parliament itself, through its equal opportunities, can help that process, but I think a great deal has to be done by all the parties. Well, now we can uh, uh, go over and uh, speak to, uh, in fact, a pair of Ewings, you might call them, who are going to be taking their seats in the Scottish Parliament. Yes, uh, Kirsty, I have with me, as you say, a pair or a brace of Ewings. Maybe that's the, the correct name for them. Yes, uh, there's, there's a dynasty emerging in Scottish politics now. Uh, we do have Winnie Ewing, who's hoping uh, and very likely to be uh, a member of the Scottish Parliament on the list. Margaret Ewing, uh, current MP for Westminster, now an MSP for Murray. And uh, Fergus Ewing, newly elected for Inverness, uh, Inverness. Uh, east, in fact, near and Loch Haber. Fergus, first of all, congratulations, but you. were you a little bit worried during that recount just how close it was going to be for you? A little bit worried, I think, is a masterly understatement. <laughs> uh, this was a, a good day for adrenaline and a bad night for the central nervous system. I was uh, pretty anxious, but uh, I'm delighted to have succeeded and uh, I pay tribute to the countless folk who have worked in this constituency over a long period of time to, to secure this result. Well, Margaret, you've been in Westminster. Uh, now, you've both been elected to, uh, to the Holyrood Parliament. Do you think it's going to be a different place from the place that you've been in all these years? You mean apart from the fact I'm going to give them cookery lessons over the weekend? Um, no, I think it will be a different place because um, certainly the kind of vision that we have shared over these many years is that a Scottish Parliament should be a Parliament which addresses the issues which affect everyday lives of people. The devolved powers which are given to us are those very issues such as housing, health and education. The SNP has a very clear strategy on that and we are determined to make this Parliament work for the benefit of the people. I've seen enough of Westminster. I think a Scottish Parliament can bring a totally new dimension into political life and make it more relevant to people. Margaret didn't mention independence there though, Fergus. Where's that on the uh, priority list? Well, independence is the aim of the Scottish National Party and independence is a process and I think we've made a significant breakthrough here in Inverness, East Nairn Loch Haber, towards that process. We've more work to do and we've more people to persuade, but the Scottish Parliament will see the SNP grow from being a small party to being a very large party indeed, with a hugely increased force. So, I'm delighted and I'm delighted Margaret and I will be the first husband and wife team. I hope, and Margaret was telling me earlier that uh, it's a case of uh, anything she can do, he can do later. <laughs> well, 32 years ago, your mother floated to victory on a sea of yellow in the Hamilton by-election. That was seen as a sea change in Scottish politics. Do you think that what's happened here tonight is actually a change? Are we seeing something which breaks the mould of politics or a few months down the line is it going to be the same old thing again? This parliament wouldn't be here if it had not been for Winnie's breakthrough in 1967 at the same time paying all that tribute to the people who went before Winnie. But certainly that was the start of a process. This is another right. stage and if the SNP hadn't been there there wouldn't have been this parliament at this stage. It was the Scottish people who delivered through our gentle persuasion. I think Mark. my mother said, uh, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. Well, I think Scotland is now uh, clambering aboard. Margaret Fergus, thank you very much indeed. Well, we'll know in perhaps an hour's time whether Winnie Ewing is uh, going to be the third uh, Ewing to, to join the, uh, the, the clan, if you like, in the Scottish parliament. But from in Inverness, for the moment, it's back to you in the studio. Thank you very much. I want to throw straight to Peter, who is going to uh, give us the state of play at 10 to 6 on Friday morning. Night, Kirsty. Well, in a night full of surprises, perhaps the most remarkable surprise is the split between the first and second votes in Scotland. These were the votes for the constituency seats. These, uh, starting with Labour up there on nearly 39%, 29%, the first vote for the SNP, 15% the Conservatives, 14.5% the Liberal Democrats. Compare that now with the second vote and every single party drops away in the second vote. Not what we expected at all. 36%, a drop of 2.4% there for the Labour Party, a drop for the SNP, drop for the Tories, drop for the Liberal Democrats. Of course, they've all gone to others like Tommy Sheridan's Scottish Socialist Party and so on. That's where they've gone, other parties, the Greens and so on. Uh, and the shape of the Parliament that we expect to see as a result of all this, it's going to meet just below Edinburgh Castle for two years, but then down at the bottom of the Royal Mile, right in front of Holyrood Palace, this great big new chamber will be built. It's under construction right now, and we're going to go through the doors, and we're going to see just what sort of shape the uh, members of the Scottish Parliament will make of that chamber. Here we have, first of all, the party we're forecasting to be largest in that Parliament, 
Donald Dewar's Labour Party, few results still to come, but 57 almost certainly is going. He's going to end up. Then we're going to have the Liberal Democrats under Jim Wallace at 17. Then the Tories, uh, the Conservatives under David McCletchie at 18. The two uh, others, and of course, then we'll have the Scottish National Party on 35 under Alex Salmon. And just a bird's eye view of that for a moment. Here is the uh, winning post coming down here that uh, divides the parliament in two. 65, half of 129 plus one, so that you get a picture of what, just how near Labour is to that winning post. 57 Labour members of the Scottish Parliament, just short of it. With the help of the Liberal Democrats on 17, though, they should be able to control the parliament. Uh, and then the Tories and the SNP over here in opposition, Kirsty. Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, we can tell you that AIR has gone to a second recount uh, on the first vote. Uh, the first recount was 15 in favour of Labour, so they are recounting yet again. Uh, Mark Rifford, extraordinary, um, this wait in AIR to find out whether you're going to have your solitary MSP elected through the constituency. Yes, this is a very strange night. I hadn't even been expecting uh, Phil Galley to even get close on this particular occasion. Uh, if it's a recount, that is actually marvellous news. Um, and yet, Henry McLeish, I mean, uh, that would certainly not be good news for you and Eric. It would be actually one of your d d disasters of the night, if indeed there are disasters of the night. Well, I think we're ahead just now on the first, uh, first uh, ballot, <laughs> as it were, because it's a slight note of disagreement. And, uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure that we will retain that uh, when the recount takes place. But I think the point I return to Ella, it's a pity they weren't going ahead with it now, because it's just going to be difficult to delay that and mess up the local government count, account as well. Um, still to come for the Liberal Democrats, uh, a, few, a few more names to come ahead. Well, yes, I mean, I think what's, what's interesting to us is that the, the, the list seats, we've got all our first-past-the-post seats, including Gaines. But in the northeast of Scotland, for example, we are really hoping that we might have the possibility of getting Maitland Mackey elected off the list. But not having had the breakdown, I'm not sure whether that will be the mm. case. But we're looking, 17 you're predicting, we think we could have possibly 19 or 20, depending on how the regional list breaks down. And Ian, where do you think uh, our predictions sit uh, with what your reality might be? Well, it's a dramatic advance for Scotland's party and I'm sure that uh, we will end uh, this election and be in the position of having our biggest ever uh, electoral presence. Well, I mean, we're now hearing, uh, Brian Taylor, there's five votes in it in AIR and they have sat down again to have another recount. AIR is always an entertaining political prospect, isn't it? It always was when it was George Younger trying to... Uh, d defend the place. Uh, I, I'm, I'm slightly surprised to hear Malcolm Rifkin say that he'd given up completely on Phil Galley winning the seat. But I think I think on this particular very, very disloyal to a, for, a former yeah, Westminster no, no, colleague. No, 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 if I could be wicked at ten to six no, in the morning. No, I'm not, I don't want to just give political rhetoric. I'm trying to tell you what our judgment had been. Yes. And our judgment was that although Phil is an absolutely first class MP and certainly deserves to win, we did not think he would be able to bridge that gap on this occasion. Absolutely. In fact, he's come closer than any of our other candidates absolutely. to winning first past the post and that I'm very delighted by. David Demmer, what this election does throw up is that there's enormous variations all over the country in the, uh, in the way the whole process yes. is carried out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although, the, I mean, there are trends that, are, that, that, that certainly can be, be pointed to. And, and, and the plain fact is, in terms of popularity, Labour have, uh, you know, not done very well. They have lost popularity as compared with the last election. And well, that, that shows up in like losing to and possibly Would you seats. expect this as a well, midterm? No, I mean, what's, what's strange is that in, in this midterm, I mean, Tony Blair and the Labour government uh, in national still, polls are miles ahead. And yet when it comes to, you know, votes in the ballot box, the gap seems to, you know, be not quite so, what it's so appears there's in there's the national polls. Yep. On, on that point, I mean, I've just been checking the air results of the general election. We lost by 6,000 votes at the general election. Now, if it's a recount, with a difference of five. You might have said the air is natural Tory territory. Well, but, the, but there were boundary changes, which didn't help us, in mm. fact. But right. nevertheless, the difference between 6,000 and five is a pretty severe problem for Henry McLeish and his friends. Well, right now, there is still so much to play for. And uh, in the next stage of BBC programming, we hope to hear a lot more, not least the air results. And here's Sally Magnuson to tell us what's coming up next. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Breakfast News is coming up next at 6 o'clock and we'll be bringing you the remaining results in Scotland. Still, of course, as we hear, a very exciting picture with lots of results still to come in. That second recount at uh, air to look out for. Plus the latest on the Welsh elections, the English local elections and other national and international news and sports. So do join us uh, in just a few minutes' time at 6am for Breakfast News.
And at this stage, uh, not only is devolution a process, this election is a process. Donald Juris said that John Smith would be proud to see what has happened today. From all of us here, good morning. Best Actress Best Actor Best Comedy Performance The best in the business. The British Academy Television Awards with Michael Parkinson. Sunday at 8 on BBC One. Good morning, welcome to BBC One. A look at today's weather now with Michael Fish. Good morning to you. I think all the people working on those elections, me too, come to that. Probably going to be in the best place before long. And that's bed because there is some pretty wet weather on the way as these weather fronts come up from the southwest, wet and fairly windy too. We've had the rain gathering during the night, two or three bands of it already working northwards. And this one down here is quite a heavy one too. In fact, there are some rumbles of thunder mixed in in the channel. That rain continues to march steadily northwards across the country, or at least most parts of the country today, remaining areas during tonight. Then there's a little bit of a lull, some showers, then another area of rain coming along for tomorrow. So a weather watch for heavy rain in Wales, central and southern England with those downpours causing some localised nasty conditions if you're out and about. The rain already into southwestern parts as we've just seen from the radar picture. That rain moving up further north coming up to London and around the middle of the morning, middle late morning up towards Manchester into Northern Ireland at the same time. Remaining quite grey along those eastern coasts but it is, I think, parts of Scotland will probably have the driest and the brightest weather, but eventually the rain will even move up into northern England, into southwest Scotland, allowing somewhat brighter weather, although with one or two showers, to come into much of Ireland, South Wales, and a good part of southern England. It is surprisingly going to be warm once the weather brightens up, and even where it doesn't in the south, 17 or 18 degrees, staying pretty cool, though, along those eastern coasts. During this evening and tonight, the rain continues to move northwards into Scotland, Broken cloud following along behind, a fairly mild night everywhere. That's all from me for now. Oh, look, it's that Brian Turner. Oh, I've got a bone to pick with him. Brian! Me? Yes. Well, you see, I reckon I could teach you a thing or two in the kitchen. Are you challenging me? Well, my culinary creations are the talk of talkie. OK, name the ingredient and let's find out. It's the deal. <laughs> this is going to cause a bit of a stir. <laughs> Anything you can cook, 9.45 weekdays on BBC One. Let the cooking commence. Breakfast news and business breakfast now on BBC One with Sophie Rayworth and in Glasgow, Sally Magnusson. The people of Scotland wake up this morning to discover just who will run their new parliament, the first in Scotland for nearly 300 years. Good morning and welcome to Breakfast News from Scotland. The makeup of the new parliament is now becoming clear. Donald Dewar looks certain to become first minister with Labour the biggest party but without enough members to control the parliament outright. And in Wales, counting begins in just over three hours. The early suggestion is that Labour may fail to win an overall majority and their leader, Alan Michael, may not get elected. And good morning from London. In the English local elections, the Tories have gained more than a thousand seats. Labour have lost ground with the Liberals taking control of Sheffield. And one other headline, Yugoslavia agrees to allow a team of UN humanitarian officials into Kosovo. Well, good morning. The makeup of the first Scottish Parliament for almost three centuries is now becoming clear. Labour, as I say, are the biggest party, but are unlikely to get enough seats to give them overall control. A deal with the Liberal Democrats would then be on the cards. So here's the picture so far. With 92 MSPs now elected, the Labour Party have 52 seats. SNP are on 19. Lib Dems have 15. The Conservatives, five. And others hold five seats two seats rather, beg your pardon. The final BBC forecast gives Labour 57 seats, that's short of the 65 they need for an overall majority. The SNP 34, the Conservatives 
19 uh, Liberal Democrats are on uh, 17 and the others two. The Scottish Labour leader Donald Ewer paid tribute to his party's former leader John Smith, he said, would have been proud to see what's been happening today. Well, our political correspondent Carl Walker has been looking back at the night's events. I declare that Tom McCabe is elected. Labour's Tom McCabe became the first person to be elected to the first Scottish Parliament in almost 300 years, just an hour and a quarter after the polls closed. It was, he said, a very significant achievement. Labour is on course to be the largest party in the new Parliament, but without an overall majority. There was embarrassment for the Labour hierarchy in Falkirk West. Dennis Canavan, a left-wing member of the Westminster Parliament, pulled off a remarkable victory, rejected by the party's selection panel, expelled for standing as an independent, he beat the official Labour candidate by more than 12,000 votes. He said the brilliance of his victory was tinged with sorrow, that he was not a member of the party in which he was virtually born and brought up. I do hope that some reconciliation might be possible, uh, as long as there is an understanding that on my part there will be no compromise on the principles and policies which I have always held dear and which I used to think that the Labour Party also held dear. Donald Dewar, the Scottish Secretary, went to his party's campaign headquarters in Glasgow, clearly relieved at having won his seat and taken a step closer to becoming Scotland's first minister. Earlier, he said, the election heralded the birth of a new Scotland. The first six words of the Scotland Act read simply, there shall be a Scottish Parliament, and with those six simple words, Scottish politics are forever changed. And I am proud that my party, and I am proud personally, be associated with that change. But Labour's share of the vote was down in many traditional strongholds. The new voting system meant electors cast two votes, so some members were directly elected and others won seats from the top-up party lists. The top-up system gave Tommy Sheridan, left-wing firebrand leader of the Scottish Socialist Party, a seat. He's vowed to fight for the redistribution of wealth. The Liberal Democrat Scottish leader Jim Wallace won his Orkney seat by a huge majority. Already there are questions as to what sort of deal might be brokered for Labour and the Lib Dems to form a coalition to control the new parliament. I certainly take the view that first and foremost we should negotiate the terms of a partnership programme for government and then deal with ministries and personalities. Although I rather suspect that over this weekend there's going to be lots of speculation about personalities, but at the end of the day it's more important what we actually achieve. Several hours later than expected, the Scottish Nationalist leader Alex Salmond won his seat in Banff and Buchan. This was, he said, the dawn of a new era in Scotland and his party would be a powerful group in the Scottish Parliament. Each and every one of us who has had the privilege to be elected to it has a heavy burden of responsibility to make sure that Parliament works well for Scotland, builds the confidence of the Scottish people and takes this nation on to national freedom and independence. Thank you very much. The Conservative leader in Scotland, David McCletchie, failed to win his seat in Edinburgh Pentlands on another disappointing night for the Tories north of the border. He put a brave face on it, still hopeful of Tory prospects through the top-up system. There's no first and second class members. What people are looking for in the Parliament are effective advocates uh, of uh, party policies, and that's what they're going to get with me and the colleagues who will be joining me on the Scottish Conservative benches. Votes are still being counted, but the likely outcome sets the scene for some long negotiations, with the Liberal Democrats demanding an end to tuition fees as a key price for coalition with Labour to control Scotland's new Parliament. Carol Walker, BBC News, Glasgow. Well, joining us now from the Labour Party headquarters is our political correspondent David Porter. What's, uh, what's the mood down there, David? Sally won very much a satisfaction. The view amongst the number crunchers here at Delta House in Glasgow is that our estimates on the poll that we've been giving this morning are very much in line with what Labour are thinking. So we are dealing with a new era of politics, not just for a Scottish Parliament, but also we're going to be dealing with coalition politics as well. Labour, the single largest party, but not large enough to have an outside, outright majority, so they will need the Liberal Democrats and the help of Liberal Democrats if they're going to uh, govern and get that majority. Has there been disappointment there that Labour's vote has been down in, the, in their safe seats? 
There has this election has been a bit surprising in that, in that seats that Labour thought that they perhaps wouldn't win, and seats that they thought that some of the other parties would have won, um, haven't gone like that. It was bitter disappointment, I've got to say, at the um, victory for Dennis Canavan. I think everyone here knew that Dennis Canavan was in with a very good chance of winning that seat, and indeed all throughout the yesterday they were uh, on the telephones from here, canvassing uh, voters very, very hard. But bitter disappointment at the size of Dennis Canavan's victory. But very great, um, very great. Uh, I suppose the only way you can say it is joy that um, Labour managed to hold on to govern. I think that was a seat that secretly they were thinking that they might not hold on to. There was a very strong SNP challenge there with a very high profile candidate from the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon. There was a very, very big cheer when the government result came through in the early hours of the morning. And all the talk there presumably of, of coalition deals, what, what uh, way do they uh, reckon that Donald Dewar will, will be jumping today? Well, publicly at least, and indeed Donald Jewell, when he arrived here a little bit earlier, said that they were not actually thinking about that at the moment. They will wait till all the results are coming in. And what we're seeing at the moment is on the, the first constituency votes, the first past the post uh, votes, that's where uh, Labour really piled up a lot of the votes. And as we're seeing some of the top-up votes now, that's where the other parties are going to improve their share. But they're not saying so publicly that they're, they're thinking about a coalition, but behind the scenes, yes, I'm sure the talks will be getting very, very soon, if not with the Liberal Democrats, strategy meetings will be going on within Labour to decide what tack they take. David Porter, thank you very much indeed. Well, more from uh, Scotland shortly, but uh, for the latest on the English local election results uh, and the rest of the day's news, we can go over now to Sophie in London. No, in fact, no, we're going, we're, we're going over to Wirra Davis first in Cardiff uh, for the latest on the Welsh count, which uh, hasn't begun yet, Wirra, but n not long now. No, thanks that, that, indeed, Sally. Thanks from Cardiff here. Um, voting gets underway here in Wales in just over three hours' time to decide the makeup of the Welsh Assembly. Just as in Scotland, the Assembly will greatly affect people's lives here in Wales, but early indications suggest that Labour may not have got the overall majority they once expected and that the real winners today could be Plaid Cymru. Now, an overnight BBC elections poll suggests that Labour will win between 28 and 32 seats with an overall majority far from certain. Plaid Cymru are projected to win between 13 and 17 seats, by far their best showing in Wales. The Conservatives are down to about seven, between 7 and 11 seats, and the Liberal Democrats could win between 4 and 8 seats. Uh, At the end of an historic day when the people of Wales voted for their own National Assembly, ballot boxes arrived at counts across the country. Election night surveys show that Labour will quite easily be the dominant party in the 60-member body. But a Labour majority is by no means certain, nor can the party's leader in Wales be sure just yet that he's won a seat. I'm quietly confident that I will be there uh, once the votes have been counted uh, with uh, a Labour majority. It may be a small one, it may be a little larger than we dared hoped for at an earlier stage. Uh, we'll see later in the day. Labour staff are clearly worried by the apparent closeness of the result. A very low turnout and a record showing for the Welsh nationalist Plaid Cymru has clearly squeezed what once looked like a dead cert for Labour. It's a remarkable result for Plaid Cymru. Plaid Cymru has always been a sort of fringe party in Wales, um, not seriously challenging in any areas outside the Welsh language heartlands. And suddenly Plaid are popping up with, with the poll suggests, between 14 and 18 seats and doing remarkably well indeed. But Wales must wait for a few hours yet. Although the votes were separated and verified last night, the count doesn't begin until later this morning. The purple ballots will elect 40 assembly members in traditional first-past-the-post contests. The second, orange papers, elect 20 members on a system of proportional representation. We won't know the shape of Wales' political future, or indeed whether Alan Michael has even won a seat in the assembly until later today. Murra Davis, BBC News, Cardiff. Well, uh, as, as you say, we're, uh, we're not going to know until later on about Alan Michael's seat, but that is the, the, the big excitement today, is it not? How, how are his prospects looking now from, from what we, we, we know from the polls, the exit polls? It's basically impossible to tell. I don't think I or the BBC would want to put its head on, head on the block at this stage. Basically, Alan Michael isn't standing in a directly elected seat. He's hoping to win a top-up seat in Mid and West Wales. And basically, there's a whole conundrum of, of equations, but so we really don't know if, if he'll win or not. The key factor, of course, is that Plaid Cymru have done exceptionally well, and that's quite clear already. Um, although Labour, I 
by far and away the biggest party in Wales, that it looks like they may not get a majority. I'm, I'm not saying they're definitely not going to get a majority, but Plaid Cymru really are the winners, and they could, at the end of the day, um, prevent Alan Michael uh, getting a seat in the National Assembly for Wales, which would be a huge shock for, for Labour and for him personally. Why do you think Plaid have done so well? Well, basically, this is their raison d'etre. This is why Plaid Cymru exists, of course. It's, it, it's, it's the end of a dream, if you like, for, for, for David Wigley and the other members of Plaid Cymru. I think one of the key things in Wales is voter turnout. It could be as low as about uh, in, the, in the 40% mark. I remember, only 50% of the electorate actually turned out uh, for the referendum vote two years ago. And what happens is, within that low turnout, Plaid Cymru voters actually turn out in great numbers. So maybe 75% of Plaid Cymru voters will turn out, whereas maybe only 25%. 30% of Liberal and Tory voters will turn out and Labour, obviously their voters haven't turned out in droves and that's the thing I think which will affect the, the big turnout here. And just remind us where are the timetable for the rest of the day? Well, basically, voting starts at about, uh, sorry, counting starts at about 9:30 across the whole of Wales. We should get results in around lunchtime, and the eventual historical makeup of, of the 60-member Welsh Assembly, which will meet behind me just there in, in Cardiff Bay, will be known early to mid-afternoon. Thanks very much, Wera Davis. More from Wales later, and more indeed from Scotland shortly. But now we'll go over to uh, Sophie in London for the latest on the English election results and the rest of the day's news. Sophie. Sally, thank you very much. Well, in the local elections in England, all three main parties are claiming victory. Although Labour suffered losses, Margaret Beckett said it was the first time this century that the government party has been ahead of the opposition in mid-term elections. Labour had 36% of the vote but lost control of 17 councils and lost almost 800 seats. The Conservatives got 33% of the vote and won an extra 35 councils and gained more than 1,000 seats. The Liberal Democrats had 27% of the vote, lost control of six councils and were down around 90 seats. Our local government correspondent Rory McLean reports on the night's events. As a test of Conservative fortunes, these local elections in England show, despite some high-profile wins like this in Bromsgrove in the West Midlands, the party's fortunes have only slightly improved. But that's enough to allow claims of a recovery. It's been a good night for the Conservative Party. We, we started, if you remember, two years ago in third place in local government. We're now firmly in second place and moving forward. We've won councils the length and breadth of the land. We've got many more councillors. This is the Conservative Party winning again. In Trafford, Labour did manage to hold on to control of the council which the Conservatives had targeted, but the party has already lost around 18 councils. However, there are grounds for claiming overall this is not a bad result. It does suggest that we are still um, more popular with the public uh, than any uh, government this century has been at this point between elections. I don't think it means we should be complacent or rest on our laurels. The Liberal Democrats lost half a dozen authorities but were buoyed up by taking Sheffield where Labour has been in power almost continuously for 73 years and the party was also pleased with its share of the vote. A larger share of the electorate voted for us this time than on any of the three last occasions, the general election, last year's council elections or our record four years ago. We're very pleased. There are a number of recounts going on and results from the 32 local authorities in Scotland and the majority of the 22 councils in Wales are due later today. Rory McLean, BBC News. Other news now and a negotiated settlement to the Kosovo crisis moved a step closer to reality yesterday with the seven-point peace plan offered by the foreign ministers of the Western powers and Russia, the so-called so G8. Although the plan has yet to be endorsed by the UN Security Council, it offers the first real sign of hope for some time. The talk may be turning to peace, but the bombing continues relentlessly. Last night, NATO again targeted fuel storage tanks in the southern city of Nish. As important as the bombing, NATO hopes the reasonably united front it's now struck up with Russia will bring success. All eight major world powers will now back a UN resolution designed to highlight Serbia's isolation. So far, there's been no response from Belgrade. President Milosevic has hinted that most of his forces could leave Kosovo in a week, but he's given no suggestion yet that he will accept the sort of international force demanded by NATO. As the refugees continue to pour out of Kosovo, Belgrade has agreed to allow a UN humanitarian mission into the province. It could be a hint by the Yugoslav government of a willingness to compromise. But NATO is taking nothing for granted. 
as well as this artillery being lifted into position in Albania, the United States has just approved the deployment of an extra 176 warplanes to the region. John Lyne, BBC News. Doctors are to be given the go-ahead today to prescribe Viagra on the NHS, but it's likely the drug will only be available to a limited range of patients. Our health correspondent James Westhead reports. Got the pills. This is how they come, eh? yeah. Tony Wilkinson is likely to be one of the few entitled to Viagra on the NHS. He broke his pelvis in an accident, so his impotence has a physical cause. But for most sufferers, the cause is difficult to diagnose, so they'll be denied pills on the NHS. I think that's wrong. Uh, it's, it's not fair on everyone, because they've got the same problem as me. But the government is worried demand for Viagra could bankrupt the NHS drugs budget. If it confirms guidelines proposed in January, the pills will be restricted to those with a clear physical cause. 15% of impotent sufferers. The rest will have to pay. The Health Secretary's announcement later today should end months of confusion for doctors and patients. It may also be time to head off a legal challenge from the drugs manufacturers Pfizer, which had argued the government's temporary restrictions on Viagra were unlawful. James Westhead, BBC News at the Department of Health. American scientists are working on a new generation of vaccines to fight a range of infections from meningitis to salmonella. The researchers say the technique involves disabling a gene which makes bacteria powerless to cause disease. One of the country's best-loved children's television presenters, Johnny Morris, has died. He was 82. Johnny Morris became a household name in the 1960s with the BBC children's programme Animal Magic, where he dressed up as a zookeeper. <laughs> generations of children were captivated by Johnny Morris's rapport with the stars of Animal Magic. Look, don't you think you ought to support his head like this? Look, if you're so blinking clever, you nurse him. Go on, there. Go on, get on with it. As the hot chestnut man in the 50s, he brought to TV the yeah. storytelling skills he developed in radio. When he applied his talent to zoology, he turned a dry, academic subject into some of the most popular programs on television. Animal magic ended after 21 years, when the idea of giving animals human qualities fell out of favour. Johnny Morris and his whimsy also went out of fashion, and the academics and professionals took over from a man whose only qualifications were away with words and a rare ability to get on with both animals and children. Going to bed, then? Yes. All right. Night, night. Night, night. Johnny Morris, who died aged 82. Well, that's it from me for now. Now back to Sally. Thanks very much, Sophie. And it's uh, back to the Scottish election results, which are still coming in. We're able uh, now to uh, go over to the Liberal Democrat leader. The Liberal Democrats have had a good night and uh, could well hold the key to coalition with uh, Labour in Scotland. Their leader, Jim Wallace, has been called for many months now the potential kingmaker. It looks as if he now is. Uh, good morning, Mr. Wallace. Good morning, Mr. Wallace. Can you hear me? No, we don't have... We don't have Mr. Wallace. We may be able to go over to uh, John Pinar at uh, SNP headquarters. No, we haven't got him either. Oh, very exciting this morning. In the meantime, I'm sure Sophie's there. Sophie, are you there? I Let's am, hand Sally. Back yes, I am indeed. Um, well, as ever, Peter Snow has been number crunching and analysing all the results overnight. He's popped off for a sleep now, lucky man, but he has given us the latest on the night's results before he went. Well, Scottish voters had two votes, of course, and look first at the first votes. These are the votes for the constituency seats, and there you see Labour in the lead with some 39%, ahead of the SNP on 29%, the Conservatives 15%, and 14%, the Liberal Democrats <coughs> over here. Now, the second votes, the votes for the top-up seats, the regional list seats, Labour dropping away there again, all parties dropping away, the SNP dropping away for the second votes, Tories a bit and the Liberal Democrats a bit there. It's the others who are picking up these second votes, uh, dramatically improving the chances of the sort of rainbow group of parties off there uh, who actually only, we've had two of them, uh, Dennis Canavan effectively and of course Tommy Sheridan with the SSP in Glasgow winning seats. Now, how does that uh, mean that Scotland's Parliament is going to look? 
Those two votes combined mean that the Scottish Parliament, which is a mile down, the Royal Mile below the Edinburgh Castle, this magnificent new building that will house the Parliament in a couple of years' time, we've actually seen the plans and our artists have created this magnificent model of the new Parliament. So let's go through the doors into the magnificent chamber here and see how it'll fill up with MP MSPs. Now, of course, Labour will be the largest party under their leader, Donald Dewar, and he expects to have 57 MP MSPs. That's what we're forecasting uh, right now. And the Liberal Democrats under Jim Wallace, <clears throat> 17 members of the Scottish Parliament. The Tories under David McCletchie, 18 of them. Uh, the SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, of course, the main opposition party effectively under Alex Salmond with 35 uh, MPs, MS, <coughs> MSPs, members of the Scottish Parliament, rather fewer than we thought at the beginning of the night. Uh, the Scottish National Party may be a bit disappointed by the number of M MSPs that they've actually ended up with. So let's have a global look at that now from the uh, bird's eye view. 129 MPs altogether, and here we have 65, which is the winning post you need to get to if you're going to have overall control of this Scottish Parliament. Labour with 57, just eight short of that. You can see them here, eight short of the winning post, needing the assistance of the Liberal Democrats with 17 MSPs to get through the winning post and have reasonably comfortable control of the Parliament, whether they have a formal coalition or some kind of informal pact. Uh, maybe even trying to govern with a minority government, Labour, but that's up to them, but they're not, not that far short of the winning post. Conservatives on 18, the others on two, that's Dennis Canavan and Tommy Sheridan up here. You can just see them here. And the SNP over here, with 35. Thanks very much, Peter. Well, uh, we can now go over to Jim Wallace in Orkney. Jim Wallace uh, had the highest percentage vote of any candidate. Congratulations, Mr. Wallace. Thank you very much indeed. It does look as if uh, you are going to be asked by Labour to uh, help them form a government at Holyrood. What's your price? Well, we've always said that we want this parliament to work. We said that we would be prepared to talk to the party with the largest number of seats, that that respected the wishes of the electorate, who of course are the real kingmakers. The electorate have voted. They're deciding what the composition of the parliament is. And we obviously, if there's to be a negotiation, I mean, Labour may try and have a minority government. I still believe that the best for Scotland would be that we have a, a coalition, a programme for government, which will uh, take us through four years, which will be hammered out between the parties, because I think that would lead to stability and effective government. We obviously want to negotiate on our manifesto, and, but we recognise that it takes two to tango. Uh, but the, uh, the, I've always said, the more Liberal Democrats there are in the Parliament, the more influence we will wield. And I'm very happy indeed by the outcome of this election. I think there's a lot of pundits and pollsters with a lot of egg in their face who were writing us off earlier this week. Uh, your prediction says 17 seats. It may even be higher than that. We're, we've had a very good night indeed. And I now want to make sure that we, as a team, uh, try to make sure that the Scottish Parliament is shaped so that we actually deliver much of the expectation that was raised. This will be a Parliament that will do things differently. One of the, one of the expectations that you raised was, uh, was the scrapping of tuition fees. Is that going to be part of your price for joining Labour? Well, we said during the election campaign we believe in the scrapping of tuition fees. I think it's a barrier for many people to go on to higher education. Indeed, we also said that it was likely there would be a majority in the Parliament for the scrapping of tuition fees because both the Scottish National Party and the Conservative Party support that policy. And I suspect the two independents who have been elected, Dennis Canavan and Tommy Sheridan, uh, and if there is a majority, then the will of the Parliament should prevail. I think that is the new style of politics. At Westminster, we have so much of the government prevailing. I think we're going to see a shift in that balance between government and the Parliament. And in the Scottish Parliament, I believe if there's a majority, the majority of you should prevail. Jim Wallace, thank you very much indeed. Well, much more from Scotland in the next half hour, as well as all the sports news and a look at this morning's papers. But first, the news where you are. Good morning from UK Today. The Director General of the Prison Service visits Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight today to see how the regime has improved since three inmates escaped in 1995. Drug use and disorderly behaviour among prisoners is down, but Parkhurst's board of visitors warn the jail is understaffed. They say there are too few officers to cope with a number of inmates with severe mental problems. 
A gardener is planning to produce safety cages for ponds to save young children from drowning. Wynne Davis's idea has been praised by the family of a three-year-old boy from Wales who drowned in a neighbour's pond. It's a simple idea, but many parents are now pushing for it to be fitted to all ponds. Made from simple tubing and joints, the safety device acts like a cage, protecting plants and fish and at the same time limiting the risk of a human tragedy. In Britain, around eight children a year drown in garden ponds. Wynne Davis accepts that fascination with water can't be controlled, but he says the dangers to youngsters can be. It's submerged about two inches under water and there's um, shelves on it for marginal plants for your animal servicing. And the mesh at the top, obviously, is to stop children from drowning and the cage is there for them something for them to hold on to, to crawl out. About this time last year, three-year-old Ernie Rowan from Blino Fistiniog died after falling into a neighbour's fish pond. His family are behind Mr Davis's plans. I think it's a good thing um, if his, his invention will save just one little life and save one family from going through the anguish and the heartache we've gone through. I think it's a very good thing and good luck to him. Mr Davis is already going through the process to patent his idea. He's also eventually hoping to win enough support to put his invention into mass production. A retired shepherd is refusing to move out of his lifelong home, even though it has no running water and is crumbling away. Hugh MacDonald is a tenant in the cottage in Comrie in Perthshire, but now the owners want to sell. Hugh MacDonald, who's 83, has spent all his life at Balmoral Cottage on the edge of the Denaira estate near Comrie in Perthshire. Each day he goes outside to get the water he needs. Hugh spent his working life as a shepherd and latterly as a woodman. He's certainly a fixture here, or thought he was until the owner decided to put his home on the market. Inside a cottage where the only pretense at modern living is a cooker and a television, he showed me the letter, which indicated that owner Jill Southwood was worried about him, would try to find him somewhere else to live, but was keen to sell. I wrote back and told her that I didn't mean in the least that you sell in the cottage, as long as I was a tenant. Me here and my parents and that, we've been here for 60 years. In 60 years and five minutes. Here in Comrie, there are mixed views about Hugh's valiant efforts to hold on to Balmoral. Some point out that three times he's been offered a council house, three times he's refused one. But others say the owner of the cottage has done little to improve it over the years, even if she's pegged rent levels to just six pounds a year. I think he's a very independent man and he loved his cottage. He just, he couldn't see that there was anything much wrong with it. It's Balmoral name and it was his castle. If this is how he wants to, in the twilight of his life, stay in the home he knows and where he feels secure and happy with his own environment, well we all wish him the best of luck. Balmoral Cottage has a demolition order outstanding on it, probably a factor in the owner's move to sell. But for his part, Hugh says he has no problem about a change of owner as long as he can remain here. The Oxford and Cambridge boat race usually causes great rivalry between the two universities. But now a college in Cambridge has laid down a new challenge. The students are such fans of Winnie the Pooh that they've started competing over poo sticks. They train every two weeks and have already beaten other Cambridge societies. Now they're arranging a race with Oxford. If they win, they should be rewarded with a poo blue. That's all for now. We'll have more later. Good morning from Scotland, where voters have elected their first parliament in nearly 300 years. Donald Dewar looks certain to become first minister with Labour, the biggest party, but without enough members to control the parliament outright. 
In Wales, counting begins in just over three hours. The early suggestion is that Labour may fail, fail to win an overall majority there and their leader, Alan Michael, may not get elected. In the English local government elections, the Tories have gained more than 1,000 seats. Labour have lost ground with the Liberals taking control of Sheffield. And one other headline this morning, Yugoslavia has agreed to allow a team of UN humanitarian officials into Kosovo. While continuing the uh, election story in Scotland, our correspondent John Pinar is at the pub which the Scottish National Party have made their headquarters for the night. Uh, John, what's the feeling there this morning? Well, good morning from the drum and monkey, Sally. All morning, the SNP members here have been gamely talking out their performance in these elections, talking about spectacular gains, great successes and so on. And to be fair, um, something like 30% of the vote, something like 35 or so seats add up to a fairly substantial opposition presence in the new Holyrood Parliament. But I don't think there's any dis denying the fact, really, that the SNP in their hearts would have hoped for rather more than this. And uh, the reasons why their performance perhaps didn't live up to their highest expectations, you could argue, over in great depth. There was the gamble over the penny for Scotland, asking voters to pay more taxes than they needed to. There was Alex Salmon's decision to break a ranks, break the political consensus on the war in Kosovo. And then there was the signal, the exact pitch of the signal on the question of independence. Should they have been clearer? Should they have flown the independence flag higher or lower? All these arguments, I think, will be going on from now and for some time and to some extent within the party itself. If this is the, the, the way that the parliament finally shapes up with a, you know, a reasonably su substantial SNP majority, but not what they were looking for, how is this going to affect, do you think, the way that the SNP operates, whether they, you know, they bed down, as, as the jargon has it, in, in the devolved parliament or whether they, they seek to push for a referendum? Well, the, the, the whole, a large part of their campaign was to seek that mandate for an independence, independence referendum, and they were denied that quite clearly. You could argue that the sitting in opposition has given them, given them a measure of, of freedom. In office, they would have been uh, forced to, to do and carry out what they said they were going to do, which is to make the parliament work as effectively as possible. In opposition, they won't wish to be seen to be going back on that. They'll want to be seen to be a constructive opposition.